Hello everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about a game in development by Redstone Interactive called Beyond the Wire. Published by Offworld Industries, the developers of Squad and publishers of Postscriptum, Beyond the Wire is a World War I first-person shooter focusing on realistic, fast-paced, and fun gameplay. Today I'll be going over some of the information released in the dev blogs including weapons, roles, and sections. Then, I'll set the context of the Passchendaele map by briefly explaining the history of Passchendaele in World War I. After that, I'll go over the map released by the developers and the accompanying screenshots. Then we'll discuss what this may mean for the flow and pace of gameplay on the Passchendaele map. Just so you know, this is all purely my opinion. I'm not associated with Redstone Interactive or OWI, and I have not been invited to the closed alpha, although I have signed up. Now, let's get into it. First, we'll go over the factions. There'll be three factions in the game at the launch of Early Access, including the French Republic, the German Empire, and the American Expeditionary Force. Shortly thereafter, the British Expeditionary Force will be joining the ranks of the Allies. For weapons, we only know of weapons for the Germans and the French. For the German Empire, the primary rifle is the Gewehr 1898. The light machine gun is the Madsen Model 1905. And the sidearm is the Pistol 08. The French Republic will be armed with the Labelle as their primary rifle, the Shosha for the light machine gun, and the Model 1892 revolver for the sidearm. Not long after recording this part, we actually got a look at a few other weapons in the dev blog. Those include the MG-08 heavy machine gun and the Lange Pistol 08, both of which will be available to the German Empire. And the Ruby 1915 pistol will be available to the French Republic. Now, let's talk about roles. The first role I'll mention is the infantry officer. Responsible for his troops, the infantry officer is one of the most indispensable members of your squad. Along with giving directions to your section, he will have access to orders that affect his nearby squad members, which possibly means increased stamina or speed. Whatever that is, it's most likely something realistic, and hopefully not too overpowered. Riflemen will carry out the majority of the fighting. Equipped with a bolt-action rifle, the rifleman will carry extra ammo for his squad members. Medics will be able to pull you back from the edge of oblivion, and they'll likely serve as the only way to keep your teammates in full combat effectiveness. Light machine gunners will keep the enemy's heads down with sustained automatic fire. They'll most likely have to keep their weapons propped up on their bipod to remain effective, which means a great way to counter them will be to flank them. The Grenadier will be a force to be reckoned with when he makes it up to the enemy bunkers. Armed with rifle-launched grenades, they'll be devastating to groups of soldiers huddled together in the trenches. The Assault class will probably be something we haven't quite seen in games like Squad or Postscriptum. Armed with close-range weaponry, hand grenades, and potentially even more effective melee weapons, the Assault class will focus on clearing bunkers and trenches so the team can move up safely. The Sniper class will be a pivotal role in Beyond the Wire. Since snipers will have the ability to maintain distance and choose their engagements, they should have no issues effectively firing on the enemy. Combined with a spotter, more on that later, the sniper can focus on targets at range, and the spotter can worry about anything flanking the squad close by. The artillery gunner is an interesting concept. On top of manning the big guns, they will be tasked with building defensive positions. Since the artillery pieces in the game will likely have to be ranged similar to real-world artillery, communication will be required to bring down effective fire on the enemy. The last role is the heavy machine gunner. He'll be equipped with a large machine gun that will have to be deployed before it can be used. Paired with a heavy machine gun crew NCO, they will possess one of the most powerful weapons in the game. Now, on to the sections. Command will be the strategic decision maker for the team and will have access to smoke and artillery barrages to support the platoon's advance. The loadouts available to command will be the platoon commander and the signaler. Infantry will be the backbone of any team and will be made up of an officer, rifleman, medic, light machine gunner, grenadier, or assault troops. It's not clear how many of each specialty class will be available, but I hope it is limited for two reasons. First, I think having too many specialty rules will hurt the pacing of the game. Second, making more people pick the Rifleman class will make for a more interesting and immersive experience in my opinion. The Machine Gun Detachment will be equipped with the Heavy Machine Gun. Rules available will include the Krubin and the Detachment NCO. The Artillery Detachment has the job of manning artillery pieces and bringing down fire on the enemy. The Detachment will be led by a Gunner NCO and will be made up of artillery gunners. 
the recon detachment will be the eyes of the battlefield. Comprised of a scout NCO and a sniper, they will be a valuable asset when placed in strategic locations. Now, let's talk about the Passchendaele map. You remember when I said the developers plan on focusing on realistic and fun gameplay? In my opinion, the maps will be a crucial piece to making this happen. To help facilitate this, they've decided to focus on the later war period to give access to more weapons and equipment. For historical context, the Third Battle of Ypres, also known as the Battle of Passchendaele, started as an offensive by the Allies on July 31st, 1917. The assault was initiated mainly by British and French troops, although other countries would become involved as well. The battle quickly devolved into a quagmire of mud, blood, gas attacks, artillery bombardments, machine gun fire, grenades and bayonet charges that would send hundreds of thousands of young soldiers on both sides to their graves. The fighting was brutal, and oftentimes the Allies would lose a stretch of land only to retake it a few hours later. The terrain around Passchendaele is mostly flat with some wooded areas. By the time the war came to town, the trees were left without branches, giving almost no cover or concealment for miles. This is one reason, among others, why trenches were dug routinely to keep the troops safe from enemy fire. During the Battle of Passchendaele, mud ruled every aspect of a soldier's life. For generations, the inhabitants of the area forged the land to stay mostly dry by making delicate drainage systems which were promptly destroyed in the war by millions of artillery shells. For context, this is what Passchendaele looked like in October 1917. And this is what it looked like in November 1917. The water that used to run off the land no longer had a place to go, making the whole area a muddy pit of despair. For over three months, the Allies battled their way through the relentless terrain until finally securing the village of Passchendaele. Now that the stage is set, let's talk about the map. The first maps that are set to be released are Passchendaele, the Somme, and the Argonne. If other maps are announced, I'll make a preview video for those, and I'll also cover any new information that may have come out about the game at that time. On this map, there are a few things that stand out immediately. First, it appears that the lines that stretch north to south across the whole map are trenches. I think that's pretty clear. Since trenches are a staple of World War I, we'll talk about those first. If you look at these shots, the trenches appear to be developed and lived in, as you would expect in the late war. This lived-in feeling will be great for immersion, and the fact that the trenches stretch almost endlessly is going to be a very different experience than what most players are used to. For terrain features and structures, there's not much. The terrain appears to be fairly flat and featureless, which is accurate to the geography of the area. The structures that exist include the bunkers at the rear of each of the lines, which I believe should help keep things interesting in the later stages of a match, because if enough troops can occupy those raised bunkers, it may provide a base of fire through which the team can advance. So, you may be wondering, where are the bunkers in this picture? Well, if you look on the map, you can see that these bunkers are rectangularly shaped. There's also a mud crater behind the bunker, so on the map you can see this bunker here is rectangularly shaped and has a mud crater. From here, you can also see the town. In the town, you can see what appears to be a church. The last thing to note in this shot is the raised trenches to the left of the bunker. It appears these features pop up somewhat sparsely in the map, so it's nice to see that the lack of microterrain is being shored up by the use of these raised trenches. Building structures on the map appear to be in decent shape considering, probably to offer more cover when fighting in the village. As you can see, this screenshot makes it look like the church has been almost completely untouched, which will probably make it a key position to occupy inside the village. There are other structures around the village area, but it's not clear what extent of damage they will have sustained. On the map, there appear to be both destroyed buildings and buildings still standing as indicated by the hashed or solid rectangles. A few other things to note are areas such as Sniper's Inn, Crawl Boy's Lane, Zonabeek Forest, as well as the many craters scattered throughout the map. These areas are difficult to judge without more information, but for example, Sniper's Inn is located just behind the front line on the west side. It's probably elevated and it probably provides some sight lines back to the enemy trenches, but we won't be able to tell until the game comes out. Crawl Boy's Lane is probably a ditch of some kind that will allow for troops to move up to the village in defilade, but again, we'll have to see how that plays out. Then you've got Zonabeek Forest, which is probably not much of a forest at this time. It's probably more like a bunch of toothpicks sticking up out of the mud. So it might provide some concealment, but almost no cover. 
Now that we've gone over some of the features of the map, let's discuss how I think this will affect the game. Given the open layout of the map, I think that snipers and machine gunners will play a vital role in deciding who wins. While trenches and structures will provide some cover, a machine gun team who has good sight lines might be able to hold off scores of enemies from advancing. The only hope for a regular squad is to take cover in the trenches or somehow make it to cover inside the village. Once in the village, or occupying enemy trenches, players will be forced to use melee combat as well as close quarters firearms like pistols to defeat their enemies. All in all, these choices have me very excited for this game and I can't wait until it's released. I think the map choices will also have a profound effect on the way a match plays out, but let me know what you think about that in the comments down below. Also, consider hitting that subscribe button to support what I'm doing here. And if you made it this far and you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. Until next time, guys.